Alfred Marshall, the founder of the so-called neoclassical school, was also the first prominent economist to attempt a reconciliation of Ricardo with the marginalists. Following the senior Longfield school uh, as interpreted by Mill, Marshall treated the abstinence of capital or waiting as another form of disutility alongside labor. He thus fused them into a unified subjective theory of the cost as a determining factor in supply price. As Mill said, profits were remuneration for the capitalists' abstinence in the same sense that wages were the remuneration of labor. This Marshallian synth synthesis adopted virtually the entire apparatus of marginalism, but was much closer in spirit to the cost of production theories of Ricardo and Mill. In regard to profit as the cost of capital, Marshall cast it in subjective terms, the return necessary to persuade the capitalist to bring his capital to market. Everyone is aware that no payment would be offered for the use of capital unless some gain were expected from that use. In contradiction to the surplus value theory of Robertus and Marx, Marshall said that exchange value was the result of both labor and waiting. Marshall distinguished in much the same terms as Bohm borrowed between a gross interest and net interest as the reward for waiting as such. Of this notion of profit or interest as a reward for abstinence or waiting or time preference as the Austrians prefer to put it, we will ha have much to say in the next two chapters. Suffice it for the present to say that the market value of abstinence like the Austrians rate of time preference varies a great deal with such factors as the distribution of property and legal disabilities imposed on competition in the capital market. Marshall recasts Ricardo's twin factors of price determination, labor, and scarcity as two blades of the scissors. We might as well reasonably dispute whether it is uh, the upper or the under blade of a pair of scissors that cuts a piece of paper, as whether value is governed by utility or cost of production. Marshall believed Ricardo had erred in his overemphasis of the importance of cost or supply price at the expense of demand or utility. Regarding Ricardo's neglect of demand, Marshall wrote that it had recently received increased attention as a result of the growing belief that harm was done by Ricardo's habit of laying disproportionate stress on the side of cost production when analyzing the ca causes that determine exchange value. For although he and his chief followers were aware that the conditions of demand played as important a part as those of supply in determining value, yet they did not express their meaning with sufficient clearness, and they have been misunderstood by all but the most careful readers. As the last phase suggests, Marshall believed the shortcomings of Ricardian economics were as much the fault of poor interpretation as of the theory itself. More importantly, Marshall assert Marshall's assertion that demand played as important a part as supply was qualified by his understanding of the time factor. For Marshall, the shorter the time period, the more it was possible to treat supply as fixed for the time being, and as a result, the more the blade of scarcity predominated over that of cost, price was determined at any given time by the balance between demand and supply that actually existed at that moment. As the time factor came into play and supply could be treated as a dynamic variable, the cost blade gained in ascendancy until at some hypothetical approach to a pure equilibrium price, price approach closer and closer to cost. Marshall concluded that as ge a general rule, the shorter the period which we are considering, the greater must be the share of our attention which is given to the influence of demand on value and the longer the period, the more important will be the influence of cost of production on value. In describing the hypothetical equilibrium towards which the market tended, Marshall used a language quite similar to that of Mises concerning the value of imaginary construction. Our first step toward studying the influences exerted by the elements of time on the relations between the cost of production and value may well be to consider the famous fiction of the stationary state, in which those influences would be but little felt and to contrast the result which would be found there with those in the middle modern world. And bearing an uncanny resemblance to Bohm Barwick, he wrote that short-term prices are governed by the relations 
of demand to stocks actually in the market at any given time existing stocks of goods are all that are available pending the time lapse required for further production regardless of demand and excess goods are some cost regardless of demand's shortfall again there is no connection between cost of production and price in the cases of food in a built city a, a, of Queen, the supply of which has run short in a fever stricken land of a picture of Raphael, of a book that nobody cares to read, of an armor clad ship of obsolete pattern, of the fish when the market is glut, glutted of fish, when the market is nearly empty of a cracked bell, of a dress material that has gone out of fashion, or of a horse in a deserted mining village. Production cost is an influence on price only over time as supply is adjusted in response to affect demand and supply and demand approach equilibrium. But as Marshall pointed out, supply is itself a dependent variable. The current supply is, is itself partly due to the action of producers in the past, and this action has been determined on as the result of a comparison of prices which the expect which they expect to get for their goods with the expenses to which they will be put in producing them. The operation of supply and demand always operated over time to bring production into line with effective demand at the cost of production, and thus to equate price with production cost, demand price was always Get, uh, signaling producers to reduce or increase production until demand price equaled supply price. The problem with this this simple model, Marshall went on, was that demand was supply schedule where were subject to change so the equilibrium point toward which the market tended was itself in motion. But in real life, such such oscillations are seldom as rhythmical as those as of a stone hanging freely from a string. The comparison would be more exact if the string was supposed to hang in the troubled waters of a mill race whose stream was at one time allowed to flow freely and at another particular part partly cut off. For indeed, the demand and supply schedules do not in practice remain unchanged for a long time together, but are constantly being changed and every, ch every change in them alters the equilibrium amount and the equilibrium price, and thus gives new positions to centers about which the amount and price tend to oscillate. These considerations point to the great importance of the element of time in relation to demand and supply. But regardless of such com factors, it was nevertheless true at any given time that the market price was tending towards an equilibrium point at which the producer was just compensated for bringing his goods to market. There is a constant tendency towards a position of normal equilibrium in which the supply of each of these agents, i.e. factors of production, will stand in such a relation to demand for its services as to give to those who have provided the supply of a sufficient reward for their efforts and sacrifices. If the economic conditions of the country remain stationary sufficiently long enough, this tendency would realize itself in such an adjustment of supply to demand that both machines and human beings would earn generally an amount that corresponds fairly with their cost of weary and training as it is the economic conditions of the country are constantly changing and the point of adjust adjustment of normal demand and supply in relation to labor is constantly being shifted. If Ricardo had overstated his case in one direction, Marshall believed the fathers of the marginal revolution had overstated theirs even further in the opposite direction. Marshall held that the function foundations of the theory as they were left by Ricardo remained intact. That much has been added to them, and that very much has been built upon them, but that little has been taken from them. As for Yevans, not only did he overstate his own doctrine, but it depended on the studious misread Dean of Ricardo and Mill. There are a few writers of modern times who have approached as near to the brilliant originality of Ricardo as Evans has done, but he appears to have judged both Ricardo and Mill partially, and to have attributed to them 
doctrines narrower and less scientific than those which they really held, and his desire to emphasize an aspect of value to which they had given insufficient prominence was probably in some measure accountable for his saying. Repeated reflection and inquiry have led me to the somewhat novel opinion that value depends entirely upon utility. This statement seems to be no less one-sided and fragmentary and much more misleading than that than that into which Ricardo often gilded it with careless brevity as to the dependence of value on cost of production but which he never regarded as more than a part of a larger doctrine, the rest of which he tried to explain. Yevans continues, we have only to trace out carefully the natural laws of variation of utility as depending upon the quantity of a commodity in our possession, in order to arrive at a satisfactory theory of exchange of which the ordinary laws of supply and demand are necessary consequence, labor is found often to determine value, but only in, it, in an indirect manner by varying the degree of utility of the commodity through an increase of limitation of the supply. As we shall presently see, the latter of these two statements have been made before in almost the same form, use and inaccurate as it is by Ricardo and Mill, but they would not have accepted the former statement for a while. For a while they regard the natural laws of variation of utility as too obvious to require detailed explanation, and while they admitted that cost of production could have no effect upon exchange value, if it could have none upon the amount which producers brought forward for sale, their doctrines imply that what is true of supply is true mutus mutandis of demand, and that the utility of a commodity could have no effect upon its exchange value if it could have none on the amount which purchasers took off the market. Regarding Gevin's seemingly absolutionist statement of the determination of price by utility, Marshall pointed out that the exchange value of a thing is the same all over a market, but the final degrees of utility which is corresponds are not equal at any two parts. A trading body gives up things which represents equal purchasing power to all its members, but very different utilities. Marshall had made the same point earlier in the book using the illustrations of a carriage ride. Although the marginal utility of a carriage ride may be much greater for a poor than for a rich man, yet the price in either case is two pence. It is true that Yevans was himself aware of this, and that his account can be made consistent with the facts of life by a series of interpretations which in effect substitute demand price and supply price for utility and disutility, but when a so amended they lose much of their aggressive force against the older doctrines, and if both are to be held severely to a strictly literal interpretation, then the older method of speaking, though not perfectly accurate, appears to me nearer the truth than that which Evans and some of his followers have endeavored to substitute for it. In defense of the sophistication of Ricardo's doctrine, as he understood it, Marshall pointed out that the statement in Ricardo's letter to Malthus, its supply is supply which regulates value, and supply is itself controlled by comparative cost of production. And in the next, his next chapter, I do not dispute either the influence of demand on price of corn or on the price of all other things. But supply follows close at its heels and assumes takes power re regulating price in his own hands. And in regulating, it is determined by the cost of production. He quoted Mill likewise to the effect that the law of demand, and he quoted Mill. Supply is controlled but not set aside by the law of cost production since cost of production would have no effect on value if it could have none on supply. Thus, the revolutionary doctrine of Gibbons that the influence of cost of production made itself felt through the laws of supply and demand was part of the doctrine of Ricardo and Mill. Summing up the conflict between Gibbons and classical political economists, Marshall criticized the former for neglecting the time element to save degree at to the same degree as Ricardo, for they attempt to disprove doctrines as the ultimate tendencies of relations between cost of production and value by means of arguments based on causes of temporary changes and short period fluctuations of value, as we shall see in the selection below. Yevans overemphasized the short term and his treatment of existing stocks of supply as a static factor, 
at any given time uh, was almost exactly mirrored by the later Austrians in their criticism of the cost principle.